Awesome Your Awesome Podcast. Hi there, joining us today, we have got Dr. Joshua Lee here with us. I am so honored and delighted to have you here. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here, Dr. Lee, and get into your story, your background. You are an MD, a clinician researcher. You specialize in medication-assisted treatment of alcohol and um, opioid use disorders. Give us the backstory here. Why this specialty? Yeah, I'm a primary care doctor by training, uh, and as I was coming up as kind of young doctor faculty in a medical center, my uh, the folks that hired me, my mentors who were doing a lot of addiction research, um, that became my line of work kind of as a junior you know, researcher on these larger projects led by more senior people. I loved it. And that sparked my research career, which has been focused on uh, treating opiates, heroin, now fentanyl problems even dating back to the oxycodone era, and then uh, adult alcohol use disorders in primary care, where I have always lived, that's my clinical home, and then also in criminal justice settings. I've done a lot uh, in the New York City jail system over the year as a, as a doc and as a researcher. Um, but it, it, it also corresponded with the kind of rise of addiction medicine as opposed to addiction psychiatry in the medical specialty world. So I uh, did not do training in addiction medicine, but you can do that now. And I direct and lead a fellowship at NYU that will take uh, doctors who have trained in other specialties who are not psychiatrists generally and want to do more addiction specialized work. And now there's a whole field that we call addiction medicine. Um, so that has just been happening, you know, not because I made it happen, but uh, that was the world I lived in uh, growing up as a young and then mid-career uh, doctor in a medical center. But it's been great. I love treating addiction. I love the challenge, kind of the ups and downs, the disappointments. Um, but the fact that, you know, you can take what used to be a kind of an ignored, forgotten, stigmatized, shameful condition and really, you know, help people in a way they maybe weren't expecting. Uh, if they've had multiple experiences with the healthcare system that were not great, uh, that's particularly relevant in, um, in opiate use disorders, uh, where people have probably had a lot of medical, you know, ED visits or trips to this or that doctor. And they're always uh, not always um, pleasant or welcoming or really kind of collaborative. And then if you take a kind of newer, more modern approach to offering evidence-based solutions. We have a lot of good medications uh, for both alcohol and opiate disorders and smoking. Uh, and then doing it in a kind of, you know, empathetic, non-judgmental, uh, collaborative way. People are like, whoa, you know, like that that's never happened to me. But um, you can you can really move the needle on these problems that were historically thought of as kind of intractable or untreatable. Um, and do it now in general medical settings, in private, in an emergency room, in a general psychiatry practice, uh, in places throughout healthcare that we didn't really think of previously as addiction treatment settings. They're not special drug and alcohol programs. Uh, those still exist, of course, and are very important. They're not methadone clinics uh, for, um, for opiate use disorders, but we can use other medications in other settings. And that, um, again, I, it's been a privilege to kind of work in that space and have my career coincide with the launch of new medications like Suboxone or buprenorphine products um, and to be able to research them and to be able to play a little part in kind of their growth. Um, and that, that did not exist in the 80s, really in the 90s. It wasn't really until the 2000s that we were getting a lot of traction um, and could really kind of make a, a specialty out of it. So. That's where I'm at. Wow. Okay. So many questions for you. So give us a little background here in terms of, I know this is such a broader question, but how this works. So are you replacing uh, the one medication or one addiction and feeding it with something else that's less harmful? Is that kind of the general idea? Or can you help us understand that? 
Yeah, it depends on what we're talking about. Um, but there are medications that help you not use the, the substance that you're having trouble with and um, not like it as much, not get as much out of repeated use uh, if you do continue to use uh, and then help you kind of stay off it and get away from it in terms of your recovery and, and long term. Um, you know, kind of change of behavior. Um, and that's different for opiates where we do have two uh, very important medications, very familiar one, methadone, uh, the slightly newer, but not really new, uh, buprenorphine, which is uh, the original brand name for that was Suboxone. Uh, those are opiates. So you're moving from say heroin, fentanyl, which you use a couple times a day, uh, mostly not to get sick. And now you're using a long acting kind of slow, boring, opiate that will keep you stable, feeling pretty normal, not high, not intoxicated. Uh, you can do your job, you can take care of your kids, you can get sleep at night. So it breaks a cycle of kind of being chaotically having to self dose yourself every couple hours, um, in part because you'll, you know, you'll get sick that frequently uh, when you have a heroin problem. And on these medications, that's all kind of smoothed out and uh, and goes away. It's it's very well treated. However, they are opiates, so you, your body still is taking an opiate every day. And if you suddenly uh, did not have access to or withdrew from those medications, you would in fact get some form of opiate withdrawal. And so people know that or learn that it, it is one of the you could say kind of shortcomings, but also one of the benefits to these medications that you you really have to kind of get on it and, and be on it long term. And you can't just suddenly stop those two medications in particular. Other treatments are not exactly that. So for smoking, there's a variety of medications um, that are kind of brain drugs. Uh, one of them's an uh, antidepressant. Uh, another one more exquisitely targets the nicotine receptor. Those of you are probably on for a shorter amount of time. They help you not want to smoke, not like cigarette smoking as much, uh, ho hopefully helps you quit, but you don't probably stay on those long term. And there's no real withdrawal if you stop those. They're not forming a physical dependence uh, in your brain to that medication. In alcohol, we also use a, an opiate based medication, but it's, it's not a narcotic. It's an antagonist or a blocker of the opiate system that's called naltrexone. Uh, there's a couple other medicines we should talk about, but that's our kind of first line, most popular, uh, most most heavily used drug for alcohol. That is not a kind of an alcohol agent. It's not replacing alcohol. It's not uh, a sedative uh, like we sometimes use benzodiazepines like Valium or Librium in the treatment of alcohol withdrawal, in part because it replaces alcohol in the brain and smooths kind of the, the recovery and taper off um, sedatives like alcohol and lets you kind of stop drinking safely, not have a seizure. But that's a, a pretty actually rare thing to have to do in alcohol treatment. With naltrexone, you're on a blocker that helps you not like alcohol as much, helps you not want to drink as much that night. Uh, if you do drink, you don't necessarily enjoy it as much and helps people hopefully really cut down or stop drinking entirely and then and then keep it that way while they're on the medication. But that medication, if you stopped it, there's no physical dependence, it's not a narcotic. You're not replacing uh, the substance with something like the substance. But uh, as I said, in the case of opiates, you do do that with two of our medications. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Lee, one thing, you know, your audio is a little low. So okay. I don't know if you're able to just turn that up a little bit. But I hit uh, the little mic lever all the way to the right, if okay. that helps. All right. Um yeah, hopefully that will help. Now, let me ask you. So, you know, this is such an interesting insight. So uh, for people to, who don't know this, and even for me, I'm having this insight around because it's almost like your body becomes immune, like with fentanyl, let's say you're no longer really getting high. What's happening is you're essentially having withdrawals if you don't keep taking it. You feel something if you don't keep taking it versus feeling something when you take it. Is that accurate? Uh, generally, yes. I mean, I, th I think people feel when they immediately take it, they might still feel day to day a little high or uh, a lot of relief. Uh, they're kind of back 
at a good drug level, if you will, and that probably is a is a really good feeling. And you can feel that every time you use. But part of that is not like the first time, not like, oh, I'm using a drug and now I feel, you know, really altered. My mind is elsewhere. I've never felt this way before. Uh, I really, really like this, a kind of pleasant, fun, high. Uh, you're right that a, a lot of the use is compulsive use because people will otherwise feel terrible or are already feeling really lousy. Uh, and if they don't use sometime this afternoon, it's just going to get worse and worse and going to become kind of a, a uncontrollable crisis, which is acute opiate withdrawal for uh, for most people that, that are stuck with that problem. So that means you got to use a couple times a day, whether you like it or not, because you're going to feel so terrible. So to prevent that kind of negative stimuli, you need to, you need to use repeatedly and use regularly. So I think that's true that people would say six months into a daily heroin use pattern, the motivation isn't to feel great a couple times a day. It's, it's to not feel lousy would be the probably overriding sentiment. Wow. This is so interesting. And now, you know, for you, when people arrive to you, are they have, uh, I'm assuming there's a myriad of scenarios here, right? They, they're they either, they've overdosed and then they end up in the hospital. And then is that kind of where you come in or they voluntarily come in and say, hey, I need something yeah. to help? What does that usually look like? Yeah, in a big hospital, you're going to get a mix of all that. You could get people admitted for an infection and they have a, say, a heroin fentanyl problem. And now we can help them with that. They're in the emergency room because they did overdose and uh, the ambulance brought them in for further resuscitation. Um, and then I, I'm sitting in primary care usually where people uh, are coming in voluntarily. They recognize they have a problem that they want help with and they have heard about us or somebody referred them to us or their friend is a patient with us and they come in in a more kind of low key manner on a voluntary basis at a, at a time that we have kind of pre-scheduled much like you would go to a doctor for any other kind of outpatient chronic problem. Uh, and they're there for treatment, much like you might say, hey, I'm I'm having all this. Um, I'm always thirsty. I'm peeing a lot. And my grandmother had diabetes. I'm worried I might have diabetes. I'm 50 years old and 20 pounds overweight. You know, let's let's go to a primary care center and see see what's happening. I'm 50. I finally need to go to the doctor or something like that. Uh, the same stuff is is happening for us in primary care um, or often in a in a methadone clinic uh, where people are showing up because they want help. You know, they're ready for treatment and they think the the treatment offered at that place, you know, something they're interested in. And now, um, so you, do you find, because, you know, this is, I don't even know out in the, you know, broader scope of things, how readily available this information is. Like, I would imagine a lot of people don't even realize because generally when you hear of addiction, you hear of a recovery yeah, or a rehab totally. or intervention, right? I don't think yeah. most people realize, hey, I can go to the hospital or to a doctor. And it, it, so that's my first question. But the second is when they do that, does that help? Like if they start taking that drug for alcohol addiction, does that help expedite recovery in some way? Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. I, I wish I could say that, well, everyone knows now that you can just go to your regular doctor and ask for help for this stuff. A lot of docs still do not feel well educated, well prepared, well trained, or feel like they're too busy and, and have a full practice. So I'm not also going to start treating my county's heroin problem. You know, I've got all of these other people with diabetes and arthritis and you know, my, I'm not taking new patients for a couple more weeks, stuff like that. So you can, you can kind of guess, and I, I'm not sure I'll give you great data for this, but it's, um, it's still a challenge to find the right type of treatment for these problems from, you know, a treatment provider that you connect with and 
are kind of excited about. Um, the same might be said for a lot of medical problems, frankly, like people just, they struggle to get primary care appointments for anything. Um, they, uh, they tend to still kind of bounce around between kind of episodic periods of care, but not a lot of consistent primary care. And one could say it's even worse than for alcohol, opiates, um, stuff that historically have not gotten as much kind of promotion marketing or kind of connection to real healthcare, but I would say it's improving. And over my lifetime, it's gotten a lot better in terms of the number of doctors say I practice in New York state that could prescribe buprenorphine for an opiate use disorder. It's, it's a lot more than when I started. Um, but we find that it probably still isn't enough. One of the ways I think you and I connected was through Or Health. That's a company that I'm a science advisor for. Or is a for-profit company that's trying to advertise and raise awareness among adults that have an alcohol use problem that want to get treatment essentially by mail and at home, you know, in, in line with other behavioral health apps and websites um, that have really gained a lot of traction, especially since COVID. Um, recognizing that we want to go out there and advertise. Uh, we want to, um, you know, help you find our treatment without always having to go to a physical, you know, appointment or get a referral to somebody in your zip code that, that treats this problem that you may or may not have, and you may or may not be able to discover in a timely manner. Um, and the treatments are so effective and simple and safe that at least in the case of naltrexone, which is what or prescribes for alcohol, that's one where you really can just kind of hit a button and start getting treated uh, at home in private uh, and probably have a really good chance of, you know, better outcomes, about as good as you probably would have um, if you'd had more time, more work, more travel to go back and forth to a physician's office. Uh, what these medications help you do, as you were asking, is is yes, like the whole point is they they change your relationship to the the problem substance. And they do it while you're taking the medication generally. And, and pretty uniformly. Um, it's a little trickier with naltrexone and alcohol versus um, naltrexone, buprenorphine, and methadone for opiates. But if if I can get somebody on, say, a buprenorphine product that's for opiates or naltrexone for alcohol, uh, those are once a day. Uh, uh, in the case of buprenorphine, you put it under your tongue and it takes a oral naltrexone and you swallow a pill. But it's a once a day treatment for this problem. And the numbers are good in terms of the people that find success, that drink or suddenly don't have to use heroin kind of overnight. Uh, and as long as they're then kind of maintaining and retaining uh, in treatment and on those medications, their chances of having less and less of a problem with that form or substance uh, go up and up and up. So in that sense, they're, they're not cures and that in two weeks I can get you off heroin and you'll never have to get treatment again. That doesn't exist. Same for alcohol. It's going to take work. It's going to take work on your part to, you know, commit to treatment and, and commit to not so much like a bunch of hours of travel counseling and, and AA groups, although that's certainly also going to help if you're up for it. Um, but you got to commit to kind of living on this medication. In that sense, it's not that different than hypertension. You've got high blood pressure eventually it could lead to some really serious problems and death. But good news, there's a pretty cheap generic, you know, set of medications that we know a lot about that are generally inexpensive and safe and that you can start today and your blood pressure will start to go down today. Uh, and we'll do some checks and we'll make sure your kidneys hanging in there and we'll, um, you know, check your cholesterol and all this other good stuff. But over time, these treatments really do lower the risk of heart attack, lower the risk of, you know, across the whole population of sudden death and cardiovascular related death. But you have to stay on them. You know, you, you may well be on them for the rest of your life. Uh, so that can be a surprise to people. Um, I think people you mentioned like the intervention and the kind of um, uh, cable television reality show version of addiction, which is. Things come to a head. There's a crisis. There's a low point. There's a kind of come to Jesus moment. All this help is accessed. And and then the person 
you know, does yoga and rides horses for the rest of their life. Um, and that, uh, that's just, isn't how it goes. It's more like other health problems. Like this is going to keep bugging you. It's going to keep being a problem in your life until you start to get real evidence-based treatment or figure out kind of on your own, some way to do it. And interestingly, a lot of people will figure it out on their own. A lot of people, the story of their addiction is they never actually got treatment. They never saw me in a medical center, got a prescription they don't die of an alcohol related problem. They eventually slow down or stop drinking as they age. Unfortunately, not enough people are able to do that. And so these treatments, you know, can speed that up and then can help a lot of people that otherwise won't kind of pull out of it and, and figure out their own kind of path to recovery. Wow. And now, uh, you know, what about some numbers or kind of a, just an idea in terms of relapsing? You know, are you seeing less of that versus someone taking the conventional AA route or can you speak to that? Yeah, it's a little hard to compare what we, it, AA is, um, again, we recommend it for everyone, AA or other forms of kind of 12 step or kind of peer voluntary anonymous support for a addiction recovery process. And that can come in a lot of different forms these days, especially after COVID. A lot of it went to Zoom and am I doing AA? Am I doing NA? Am I doing uh, kind of smart recovery? There, There's a couple different kind of lanes uh, in that world. But we think it all is generally super helpful. Um, in the case of, say, opiate addiction, uh, it's probably good as an adjunct. Like you really need access to these medications to have the best shot at recovery. Without the medications, chances of recovery go way down. And you can't just replace methadone, naltrexone, or buprenorphine with um, a bunch of group meetings. Uh, or or it's, it's really hard to show that that is as effective as the medications we have. In the alcohol research world, um, our medications are not as kind of uniformly effective in every person. It really can be more of a trial and error, uh, which medication for which patient. Generally, they work better than placebo, something like oral naltrexone daily. Uh, there, it's a little harder to say the medication is way better than AA, and I would not say that. Um, I would say you need to kind of pick what you think you're most interested and motivated to do and consider doing multiple things, like you can take naltrexone and start AA. And that probably would be my best bet for people doing well in recovery. Um, so hopefully they're, they're all seen as kind of complementary. Um, and uh, in smoking, we generally don't have as much kind of tradition as peer support or AA for smoking. And famously, you would go to an AA moving, uh, meeting and everybody was smoking. So um, that's a little different kind of culture and tradition, uh, how we get off cigarettes. Um, but there, too, probably the medications really do give you the absolute best shot probability of a quit smoking attempt and then staying off. Uh, you mentioned relapse. Um, we kind of expect relapse across all types of addiction, um, but that's okay. That's part of the disease and the process. And it's part of people learning. It's not like a absolute failure or all of a sudden, oh, we were doing all this stuff, but you said you had a drink last night. So sorry, I can't treat you anymore. Or we have to abandon everything we were doing. We're, we're just going to keep on doing what we think is the best stuff for you. Um, no matter how many days it's been since you drank or no matter what happens next weekend. Um, and that's really, that's, that's a kind of a principle that is more, a little more modern than traditional methods and philosophies in addiction treatment. There were more so-called abstinence based, like you absolutely had to stop using and you had to not use the entire time you were in treatment. If you did use, that was kind of like a real negative event. Um, we've tried to, I think evolve in a more helpful, realistic way away from that and just focus on like the wins and not the losses along the way. Mm -hmm. And it, the, this is so amazing because it sounds like from your own experience, what you see from your uh, clinical trials and research and all of that, it's uh, showing, you know, promise and you're seeing the evidence that 
this stuff is definitely helpful in helping people. But what about accessibility? Like how how do sure. you right tackle that as someone who's really got your heart in it and wanting to help as many people as possible? Yeah, so something like or where you're going to pay out of pocket for it, but it's essentially immediately available to any person out there right now in the U.S. with an alcohol problem. Uh, that is one way to approach accessibility. You know, let the market fill some of those gaps that the healthcare system just can't proactively push at a a person driving their kids around that just doesn't have time in their day to tackle this, but is drinking too much at night. There, a, a product like Aura, again, which is kind of mail order now, Trexone, might be a solution and might bring to millions more people than would otherwise have gotten treatment in the last year, uh, this form of effective, safe uh, medication-based alcohol use disorder treatment. In the case of, say, methadone, that's a little tougher because that's a highly regulated type of clinic. I can't prescribe methadone in primary care. Say you come to see me with your heroin problem. I can, I can write for buprenorphine and naltrexone products, but I can't prescribe methadone. So you really have to find a licensed, pretty highly regulated clinic, which if you live in Cheyenne, Wyoming, they don't necessarily have one. In New York City, we have quite a few, uh, but they tend to map to where they all started in the 60s and 70s, kind of during the Vietnam uh, kind of IV heroin era, which was an original or kind of version three of the US opiate epidemic. But where the problem was, was more inner city, and that's where the methadone clinics started and kind of still remain. And then as we saw through the 90s and 2000s with prescription opiates and now the, the kind of cartel-driven heroin and fentanyl supply, it's all over. So all of a sudden you need a methadone clinic kind of everywhere. Most counties in the U.S. you could justify having a methadone clinic, but it's just not the. we just don't have that many. So how do you make that more accessible? It takes a lot of work and a lot of that is going on and, and it's led by some fabulous people I know and, and colleagues of mine at NYU. Uh, you got to like consider liberalizing the use of methadone. And that takes an act of Congress and it takes new DEA regulations and it's a schedule two narcotic. So you can't just, you know, you can't plug it into like a new app that somebody wants to start up to get everybody methadone. It just doesn't work that way for that particular drug. And so that's, that's way more complicated. And we can't just grow methadone treatment by 200% even though overdose rates have, you know, say tripled in the last, you know, five to 10 years. Um, with buprenorphine, that is less tightly regulated in that it's a Schedule Three drug. And the whole promise of buprenorphine since 2002 was that it's an opiate. It's kind of like methadone, but we can prescribe it everywhere now. And that one, uh, accessibility, I think, has gotten better and better. We recently uh, got, got done with the X waiver. I don't know if that rings a bell, but this was a, a special kind of training and slightly different DEA number that a physician and uh, other prescriber had to have in order to write buprenorphine for opiate use disorder and get CVS or Walgreens to fill that prescription. They've done away with that as of last um, December. So that's a new thing for, for our world where we don't need this special certification. You don't need it, by the way, for any other controlled substance that you can write with your regular DEA number as a physician. So this just kind of even further normalize the buprenorphine treatment. And we shall see, we're kind of waiting uh, to see if that means more and more prescriptions are getting written. That would be the hope. And that would be kind of the need based on our overdose numbers. Mm, and so two things here. Can you give us those, uh, like a sense of those overdose numbers? What does that look like um, across the board in the States? And yeah. what do you attribute that to, like the rise in the numbers? Yeah. I mean, 10 years, let's say we're in 2013. I'm going to guess we were at like 40 to 50,000 opiate related overdoses, maybe less than that in the country. Now we're up at around 110,000. That's like a doubling in, in a decade. Maybe it's more than that. But, you know, we could we could look at the numbers together. Just go to CDC 
dot gov, uh, the the famous CDC. That's where we kind of that's our dashboard for uh, overdoses in the country. But it's gotten worse and worse. The proportion of drug and alcohol deaths related to opiates have gotten worse. And that is entirely in the last 10 years driven by fentanyl. So fentanyl is a very powerful opiate that we do use in medicine, in surgery. Uh, and um, it, it's tremendously useful in the hospital, but it's out in the wild and it's been put into the drug supply. And it's not just fentanyl, uh, the exact molecule. It's, it's other types of fentanyl-like super powerful opiates. Uh, those are easy to manufacture clandestinely offshore in Mexico, and then you cut them into the powdered drug supply coming in or already in the U.S. And now you get a bag of heroin in New York, and it, there's probably a little bit of heroin still in it. That's what we found locally, but then there's also always fentanyl in it. Other parts of the country, you buy heroin, quote unquote, and you don't get any heroin anymore. You're getting uh, mostly fentanyl. Uh, that also is a, the case with counterfeit pills. So your kid buys Oxy on Snapchat or even Xanax or Adderall. They think they're buying uh, that pill from a pharmaceutical factory. It's not the case. It's a counterfeit pill. It's been pressed in a drug lab and it uses fentanyl as kind of the active component. Um, and then, of course, in, in the news a lot has been whether uh, the powdered cocaine supply has been contaminated with fentanyl. And in some cases, it probably has, although we're not sure kind of how widespread that is. So fentanyl is um, bad news. It's uh, it's something that you and I can't really do safely at home. We can try it and sometimes it'll work and we'll get really high or we'll, we'll not be in withdrawal. We'll have like a good experience, what we in kind of intended. But uh, the threshold of tipping over to where you stop breathing and have an overdose is really narrow. So we can't really tell, especially if we're buying off the street, what we're using each time, how much is in each bag from one to the next. And before you know it, people that thought they knew what they were doing were not planning on an overdose today. They're, they're overdosing and dying. And that's driven a kind of steady, steady upward facing ski slope in terms of the rate of death year to year in the United States. Uh, a little bit in Canada as well. And then interestingly, it has not been happening in other parts of the world. So there's plenty of heroin in Europe uh, and has been for a long time, but they so far have avoided a lot of fentanyl contamination. And now, uh, Dr. Lee, if there was you as a doctor and a you know researcher here, you're on the inside. What do we not know about addiction that people on the outside should know, or if they have a loved one or somebody, is there some kind of insight you can share there to help yeah, us kind I, of understand? It I think what we've been talking about all, all today, there's, there's lots of ways to get help now. You can start with like, talk to your doctor, like every pharma ad you've seen. Um, it doesn't have to be a whole dramatic this is the week, this is the Monday that we do something about, um, you know, our son's drug problem. Um, you want to be supportive of a loved one and you want to encourage them to, you know, with with their kind of own motivation and agreement, um, start to talk to people about what help is available. Particularly for opiates, there's a lot that's been mobilized through your state and your county and ultimately flowing from federal dollars that we put towards this that are, are designed to get more treatment out there, get you plugged into treatment easier, get you a lot of Narcan if you don't have that in your household, which can reverse the overdose in the immediate term and save a life. And then someone can live on to, to later get treatment. Um, people still may not, as we've been talking this whole hour, get that, that there that there is effective stuff. There's treatment that they can get that's not unlike treatment for other healthcare disorders. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a big deal. It can be a kind of normal routine. I've got this problem. I want some help for it. Here's some help. Great. It's working pretty well. Like, let's keep going with that. Um, and that that kind of mindset, maybe that kind of like, it doesn't have to be a, a again, kind of TV show type intervention in a in a trip to rehab where 
you go away and you come back fixed. Um, that generally is not how it works. Although, yes, you could still do residential treatment. Um, we're, we're talking about kind of like ongoing outpatient care for most of these problems akin to other healthcare. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, with your work in um, the prisons, so these yeah. are former addicts who obviously no longer have access to the stuff. Is there something you're learning, some kind, something you're gleaning there from them that you're able to take into your practice with, you know, people who are like still on it and trying to get off? For sure. We, we try and say people who use drugs uh, instead of addicts, uh, by the way. Um, and uh, and generally folks are I've, I've worked mostly in the jail setting in New York City. I don't provide health care there today. I'm no longer jail health care staff in New York City, but we, we still have some active research. And I, I did do that for many years. Um, people are there and not particularly happy about it. Uh, nobody wants to be incarcerated. Um, and nobody wants to be incarcerated for kind of lower level drug related stuff, which is a very. Sorry about that. I got interrupted. That is off. Um, keep going. Yeah. So I was I'm just. I'm very sorry about that. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm just making sure that ringer's off. I'm very sorry okay. about that. No. Um, problem. Yeah, in, in the jail and prison setting, um, folks, you know, kind of like I'm saying, if you're like, hey, we're there's some stuff we can do here. Are you interested in um, something we could start now, say, medication and continue when you get out? And I got a place for you to go when you get out in terms of further treatment. Um, generally, that kind of just honest, clear. We got something that you might be interested. In. I want to help you. Um, those kind of statements and interactions go very well. Not everyone is always interested in the exact kind of thing you're selling at at the exact same time that you meet with them. But by and large, people are, you know, stressed out, isolated, and unsupported during an incarceration. Um, and for most people, it's um, it's happened repeatedly. Uh, they're poor and don't have a lot of resources. Their family's not running around getting a big shot attorney to get them out of jail as soon as possible. Um, they're kind of stuck dealing with a often kind of inhumane, uncaring criminal justice system. And to then plug into that, like, well, look, I'm here and we have this study or we have this treatment program. Um, we think it could really help you and possibly you wouldn't have to go back to, to using anything or you would feel less like doing that when you do get out in 20 days or in three days, uh, because in jail, especially uh, the time incarcerated or detained is often very short. Um, and that that is a winning message. That is like a public health intervention that people are often glad to hear about and um, and take advantage of and can really work wonders of people that time get plugged in to our kind of different treatments. And so in that sense, like jails and prisons are tremendous opportunities. They're constantly clustering and sampling people with alcohol, uh, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine problems. And so it's one of the key places to offer the right kind of interventions and treatments. And people are generally, you know, not grateful, uh, but uh, appreciative um, that that is, you know, one of the resources that they can access. Um, you know, in those types of facilities, that's that's the dream or kind of the vision. And in New York City, we I think we do a pretty good job of that for the most part. You get a lot of press about how tough it is in New York City jails, and I wouldn't undersell that. But there's a lot of good stuff that's been done by good people for decades uh, in New York City to, uh, for instance, treat opiate problems with methadone, and then more recently, buprenorphine. Um, and that is a bit of a model for the rest of the country and something that a lot of county jails uh, have looked at most recently, you know, because overdose rates have continued to worsen. And it's a key place to um, implement these interventions, reduce overdose when people get out. And without it, with kind of ignoring it and doing nothing, um, you're just kind of consigning your county to having an even worse and worse uh, kind of overdose problem. So 
it's part of the solution um, and it feels good for me as an individual and as a provider, you know, and I've been able to offer it. Mm -hmm. And now, Dr. Lee, let me ask you, so for you wanting to make change here and help as many people as possible, what do you find is your biggest challenge? And are is there something that can be done about that? Are you guys working on that challenge? Yeah, I think um, part of it's like diversity. Like uh, here I am, white guy, like telling the world about how to, how to make their heroin better. A lot of people um, with these problems and disproportionately uh, folks uh, in jail and prison or most recently with higher overdose rates are from communities of color, are from uh, poorer zip codes and where I live. Um, and and that kind of, the you know, the white guy in the medical center leading the charge on on this public health challenge is probably not adequate. Um, and so I'm going to keep doing what I do, but we need more, you know, participation and more kind of uh, ownership of, um, of the solutions by the same communities that are most affected by that. And so that means like getting more, um, in general, more healthcare providers to come from those communities. And of those health providers, uh, more of them being interested in treating addiction and then, uh, you know, going back to the same clinics, neighborhoods, schools, uh, and uh, implementing some of these same interventions. And um, that, that should be more broadly supported, better funded, um, and just getting enough folks into Getting getting enough folks from say the South Bronx where we have a pretty tough overdose rate always that's one of like the 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 worst parts of New York City generally for overdose rates um, and then is more Latino more poor uh, and less resourced than most other parts of the city how do you get more of those kids to become doctors and then how do you get them more of them to you know, focus on community-based opiate treatments. Ultimately, like you, you need these types of long, long arcing solutions to some of these problems. Um, and that's not specifically something I've worked on, um, but generally, you know, we need more of that kind of stuff. And I um, would love to do whatever it takes to, you know, help that stuff come about. But um, that those are, I think, some of the challenges and shortcomings with where we at, where we're at to this point why it's gotten worse, not better. And then you could talk more broadly about drug policy reform. Again, not exactly my area, but um, what does it take to get the fentanyl supply out of the heroin? Like, can we go back to heroin? That would be, that would save a lot of lives if we could go back to the good old fashioned oxycodone overprescribing honestly, and, uh, and more heroin and less fentanyl in the drug supply. But then you're getting into kind of drug legalization, decriminalization. You're getting into less regulation for some opiates. Um, we don't think we actually want to go back to like overprescribing opiates uh, for pain uh, and getting people stuck on those same medications. Um, but if people were accessing oxycodone as opposed to fentanyl, we'd have a lot fewer deaths, kind of like just in terms of like the, the rate of drug use and what people are using. So those are more far-fetched, complicated discussions. I don't see anybody running on that platform like for president. Um, so it's it's a little hard to imagine, you know, in the immediate term, some of that stuff coming online. But uh, that's another area where if you really if you really want 110 overdose deaths a year to go away or to get dramatically better, uh, everything we've done up till now has been in the face of those overdose rates getting worse. And so you you start to kind of dream of fantastical solutions, but ones that maybe, you know, are, are more more worth a, a, a bet or shot than than we thought. Wow, Dr. Lee. Now, you know, I just have to commend you because it seems like you're really uh, you do what you do every day, but it's kind of an uphill battle, huh? It seems kind of bleak with numbers growing, but you just kind of uh, keep doing what you do and helping as many as you can. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one perspective, like I don't treat the nation's overdose rate. I treat the people that come into my center and we can really help them. And um, and I 
have some patients that have, you know, been with us in treatment in part because um, buprenorphine and methadone are long-term treatments and it's, it's hard to get off them. Uh, we've had people with us in treatment for decades now who have done very well and don't regret a second of it. Um, and we're still going to keep working with them. So you can really, on the individual level, have a lot of success and a lot of stuff that makes everybody, you know, feel good about what they're doing, um, despite what you know is kind of a, a worsening national epidemic. And there, there the problem too is like, as you say, access, like getting people, getting more people into treatment before that next overdose is a huge challenge, um, and it's something we all got to, you know, keep doing. Wow. Oh my goodness. I'm just, this has been so eye opening and so insightful. Everything you've shared. Um, I think people are going to have a lot of takeaways here and it's, um, you know, obviously a conversation that needs to be had, uh, more on a, just a bigger scale to kind of implement huge change, but this has been amazing. Dr. Lee, I just thank you so much for your time today and um, all the insights you've shared with us. Absolutely. Thank you. That's been a wonderful talk. Yeah, you've been awesome. And now in closing, Dr. Lee, if there were just one message, your hope for everyone, what is that closing message you would like to leave us with? Treatment now, some kind of slogan like that. Like there, there's easy, effective, pretty inexpensive treatment that you almost certainly have access to, even if you don't know it. Um, and uh, go get it. Go tell other people about it. Um, just Google medication for whatever it is, smoking, alcohol, opiates. Those are the three that we have the best medications for. Uh, those are pretty, once you kind of find the right, you know, vending machine, they're pretty, pretty well and easily prescribed and uh, should be something that's worth uh, worth a try. And there's no harm if you don't like it, if it doesn't work, there might be or should be other options that you can try next. And in that sense, you know, it's like other health problems. Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you, you know, today's the day, this is the week or next week is fine too. Uh, <laughs> let's um, just so people know that there's, there's help there and it is um, maybe a little less dramatic, a little less, you know, if people are, are kind of nervous about walking into an AA meeting, um, for the moment, don't. Let's not worry about that one. Let's move on to trying to get you on one of these medications. You know, you can do that kind of by yourself and when you're ready for it. And and that would be the message. Wow. That is such a powerful message. You've been so wonderful, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you.